Support the Amigos podcast on Patreon or PayPal and receive cool perks and rad swag. Visit our page at everythingamiga.com slash support. Amiga, the first personal computer that gives you a creative edge. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Amigos. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And today, Aaron, we're going to be talking about Buggy Boy. Mm, indeed. Now, remember when buggies were hot news? No. Okay. Remember when Speed Buggy was a thing? Speed Buggy is this thing, sort of. <laughs> well, you remember the cartoon Speed Buggy? Yeah. A mystery solving buggy? I didn't like buggy. it. Because basically, the, those guys, Hannah Barbera just took the same gimmick and used it over and over. Right. I didn't like it. You already had Scooby Doo. Do we need a wise cracking hu- human car or a talking shark or a caveman? It was the same crap over and over. All those things I like. <laughs> Listen, you, you talk about somebody that beat a concept to death. <laughs> Hanna Barbera just didn't stop beating. Well, it was the quality of their animation that really put them over the top. The quality of their animation is okay, but trust me, they would recycle animation like it was going out of I know. style. I you know. know? Um, well, there was a, I think there was probably a time period where people, they wanted these dune buggies. You know, I saw people that would yeah. convert uh, various types of cars to dune buggies. Volkswagen. Volkswagen. Yeah. 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 Volkswagen even had a, a car called the Thing. Yeah. Sort of oh, dune yeah. buggy ish. You know, dune buggies were a big thing in like the 60s. There's a lot of dune buggy movies. Yeah. I see them on the Mystery Science Theater all the time. Right. It's like stuff where people just drive around dune buggy. So, Buggy Boy was right on the cusp of all this coming no. out 25 years later. You know, <laughs> not to rag on this, but is that the stupidest name for a game? It's Again, not. we're going into the the the, uh, uh, the the sparky worm level of yeah. stupidity here. But, I mean, Buggy Boy, what is that? Now, are you going to talk about later about what caused it? Sometimes it to be called Buggy Boy and what time Well, I am going to go into that, Okay, well, we'll talk about that yeah. later. Uh, but for right now, Aaron, let's dive into the world of everythingamiga.com. Ooh. It's a very It's a world time. there. Yeah. It's not just one thing. It's a whole world. It's a whole glorious galaxy of goodies. Let's talk about... Uh, let's talk about Max Headroom. Okay. Boatster. When this came, uh, the Dream Catcher released this article just as we went to press last week. I love how this, I, like, I feel like a real news guy. You are a news Yeah. And uh, he looks, the DK man looks at the, uh, at the time, very uh, well known Max Headroom and his uh, game spells. Now, I was a big fan of uh, uh, um, of Max Hedger. Yeah. Matt Frewer was the guy that played him. I loved him. For people not in the know, including yeah. myself, what is the story of Max Hedger? It's a real well in the show. Uh, Matt Frewer's character has, as I recall, he's working on some kind of like artificial persona, and he's sort of uh, the whole Max Hedger thing has come from like well in the show it was a it was a. Uh, you know, when you're in a parking garage, they've got a they've got a bar that goes across to like mm-hmm. block it. It's a max headroom, like four feet. Like right. he, as I recall, he rammed into that or something. Mm. That's what I think. But it really, I don't know if it came. I don't know if it started as a commercial. I'm not sure how it started, to be honest with you. But Max Headroom did coke commercials. Mm-hmm. Max Headroom was in a lot of he stuff. He was a corporate smoke. He was like Ernest. Well, no, he was cooler than that. And the the show Max Headroom took place in the not too distant future. A lot of it was like involved, like I remember one episode where they were shooting these concentrated advertisements over the air, and it was making people go crazy. So it's like Black Mirror. Well, like. it's it. I mean, if you think about it, it's it's <laughs> kind of creepy. I think we. I feel like we get that now on the internet mm-hmm. to a certain degree. But uh, Max Headroom was a real forward-thinking show. It didn't last very long, but it was. I really enjoyed it, and it did make Matt Frewer uh, a pretty. I'm not gonna say a big star, but I mean, he went on to do a lot of stuff that that I enjoyed, uh, including his uh, turn in The Watchmen. He was in uh, Generation X, the uh, TV movie with about the X-Men spinoff. Uh, he was he played Sherlock Holmes. Really? Uh, horribly, unfortunately. When was that? This was in, the, I think this was in the 2000s or okay. late 90s. He was he did Sherlock Holmes, uh, which it wasn't that good. Mm-hmm. I like Furore, but like I said, it's not like everything he ever did was awesome. He, mm-hmm. he, he, did, he was all kinds of guest appearances and stuff. He was on a lot of stuff. But Max Hedron was sort of this weird, um, it was just weird time. Well, I mean, you know, people were into him for a while. There's a famous, um, there's a famous situation, I believe it was in Chicago, 
where someone managed to break in on one of the network feeds, mm -hmm. and it was a, someone dressed as Max Headroom doing just talking like and this is like some schmo hacked into the feed it was really famous right. this is, I, i've seen this video yeah. and it, it actually interrupted an episode of doctor who yeah it's real mistaken. creepy yeah it yeah. is very surreal it was doctor who but it was a guy in a max headroom suit mm -hmm. i don't even remember what he said but it was it's very bizarre he yeah. managed to do it twice that night mm -hmm. and they never caught the guy right uh, who did it but i don't and really that's a loose affiliation to max headroom now, I didn't know there were any really any games uh, done by this, but apparently there was a Spectrum version, and I think there was also an Amstrad version. So uh, DK goes into them. Uh, they look isometric as hell, mm -hmm. I will say that. So your mileage may vary. I've never played them. But I, I did enjoy Max Hedder. Like I said, I like Matt Frewer a lot, too. So it was good. I, I believe Frewer also appeared in Star Trek Next Generation. And I think he did a... He, I mean, he's been in a bunch of stuff. He's one of those guys you... You can't miss him. He's the wackiest guy there. Character actor. He's out, out of his mind, yeah. Now we have a, a new addition to the uh, EverythingAmiga.com editorial staff, the one and only Graham Webkey. Yeah, yeah. Graham wrote an article here. You know, I, we've got sort of this open-door policy, which I love. And so Graham wrote a piece here on Lee uh, Enfield. Uh, and uh, by the way, he also referenced co uh, Combat Zone Wrestling. So it's, if you do that, you're instantly in. <laughs> now, do you know what a Lee Enfield is? Uh, no. That's a rifle uh, uh, that uh, was, uh, my buddy knew exactly what this was. And I okay. believe it was not, Australia made, took this old rifle and actually made uh, an automatic weapon out of it. Through this, but he showed me a picture of this bizarre setup. But th it's irrelevant to the game. But that's what a Lee Enfield is. I didn't know that until... I think uh, I think uh, Graham mentioned it as well. Uh, this game is one of those classic... Remember, the, again, we reference this a lot. Remember the Dreamcatcher article on, like, framed games where, like, the, 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 the game is so small? Yeah, right. This game is, like, the poster child for that because there's always a huge picture of Lee... <laughs> And this demon guy behind what is a very small, probably what, like a fourth of the screen mm -hmm. that's dedicated to the game. <laughs> and uh, I actually watched some footage of this game. And from what I could tell, Lee rolls across through room to room and he's, and he's in combat with like stuff that just pops up randomly. Mm -hmm. It looks bizarre. I mean, the, the, the actual well, my, screens my favorite, look good. My favorite thing from Graham's article is that Lee actually has no head or arms until he starts moving. Yeah. And that's when the sprite is activated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is odd. But this is another game. I, again, I've never heard of this one. Uh, uh, it had an ST release, uh, among others. Uh, weird. Weird. But this one didn't really, this didn't get him an Amiga release. Uh, but uh, it had, a, I think it had a Spectrum release and a, uh, uh, it may have been an Amstrad, but it was definitely, or C64, but it was definitely not an Amiga. But it's something to look at. Uh, an oddity. Uh, for sure, but I enjoyed it. I thought Graham did a good job. So two really interesting articles up this week. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, Aaron. Let's see what's going on on the gamble train. It's Amiga news time. All right, man. We got a couple stories this week. Uh, this has been a big week in the world of open source remakes of Amiga games. Okay. Okay. This first one is actually an open source reimplementation of Moonstone. Ooh, we loved Moonstone. Yeah. We sucked at Moonstone, but we liked it. Yeah, so uh, there is currently development going on on this uh, where you, people have, uh, have started this uh, this open source uh, thing of Moonstone, and it looks good. It looks real good. It looks so, like Moonstone to me. Yeah, and so I think the, what they're doing is they're maybe introducing some, some additional options and things like that, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's really, really cool uh, to see uh, Moonstone, which is one of the more graphically impressive games on the Amiga, uh, get, the, uh, get the open source treatment and getting some, getting some love. I love it, I, and this is a real, sort of an anomalous game on the, on the Amiga. Uh, and we when we played it, it was a, a lot deeper than I would have anticipated. Mm -hmm. And and uh, it's so I, I, I'm not surprised. This is the kind of game that you would get a fan base for. It would, and that, so I'm anxious to see what they get into here. I'm very impressed. That'll be cool. Yeah, yeah. And there's actually another. We'll do both open source stories together. All right. There is an open source re-implementation of the Amiga first-person shooter game Gloom. Oh, man. Yeah, we played this one, too. Yeah. This is not one of my favorite titles. No. It was like, we're trying. It right. was like the we're trying game. Right. Uh, it doesn't seem to be. There's. I, I don't see any uh, any YouTube videos of this thing up yet. There are some screenshots up on the, on the GitHub page. Uh, but uh, there is work being done on this, so we will keep track of this, and as there are new developments, we will make sure and inform I wonder you what guys. they're going to do with that. 
You know, that's, I, I think that this would allow them to, you know, make newer maps more easily and things like that. Uh -huh. That's my guess. Hmm. Okay. I just don't, it is a strange, I didn't realize there was such a big, like, you know, groundswell of people being like, man, we really need gloom well, for the new season. I will say, when this came out, that was sort of a big deal because people were waiting for it, mm -hmm. something like this on the Amiga. Now, you, it didn't age well, obviously. In fact, it didn't. It didn't birth well. I mean, I remember thinking this. That this is a kind of embarrassing. If you could, I mean, considering what we're seeing on the PC. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, hey, who knows? Maybe they can do something to spruce up a bit. I, I get the feeling that this is going to be one of those things that runs on. They're going to use to run on a higher level of machine. Yeah, maybe it's going to be a, a vampire deal, as it yeah. were. Uh, there is a new announcement of a Dungeon Crawler Legacy. This is a PDA Dungeon Crawler will be released on the Amiga by Inked Pixel Software. Mm. So uh, this comes to us from our buddy Neil over at Indie Retro News. And uh, this is an example of a uh, first-person Dungeon Crawler. Looks pretty good. You love these boats. Oh, this is, this is <laughs> you know, this is, it's, it's the worst genre. It's, I, watched, it's, I watched some of this. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's a there's a little bit of here, yeah, where you actually are, it's, it's exactly the kind you love, where it's frame by yeah, frame. Frame by frame. I like these sorts of games. I don't have a problem with it, and uh, I think it might be interesting. Hey, listen, uh, I'm down with the clown for anything that comes out. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I was gonna see if there is. Uh... I see I, I the Beholder and Dungeon Master are mentioned by name in here as as uh, as. Uh, um, uh, things that were loved in the community, so that clearly they're using those as inspiration. It looks like this is this is not the uh, requirements aren't too bad. It looks like you need a 1200 with four meg RAM um, or an ECS Amiga with an O20 CPU and six megs of RAM. That's not bad. So yeah, this is this is definitely doable without yeah. spending too much money. Yeah. So uh, it's funny though. It's odd that it would need that stuff because it didn't look like it was like. It didn't look like it was blowing away the graphics. Right. Of course, that's we're, that's practically we didn't see hardly anything. So yeah. maybe it gets really awesome. True. One true. Uh, and finally, Aaron, uh, we, we talked about Jim plays games last week. He's back with a, another new video this week, and this is one that he just <laughs> knocking them out of the park. This is when UAE set up for maximum convenience. Boy, could I have used this yeah. when I was first Jim, getting into it. Jim must be reading your diary, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so he basically, this is a seven-minute video where he takes you through every single thing that you need to do to set up one UAE. Yeah. The next person that comes to me and says, hey, I want to get back into the Amiga. What do I need to do? I In the past, I've given him uh, the Cake is a Lie Gaming's Guide. Yeah. This is going to be my new go-to. You didn't give him. You didn't give him our uh, 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 Amiga Forever for Dummies video. Well, if you <laughs> want to shell out the cash for Amiga Forever, that's a different deal. I like Amiga Forever. There's nothing wrong with it. But I mean, I will say I don't use when I don't use really when you or Amiga for all that much. Well, but yeah, it, I, it, I set up guide. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good choice. I think Jim actually commented on one of our videos too. He's a, he, he's a pretty good guy. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's going to wrap up this week's roundup of Amiga news. We bear a fond farewell to the gamble train as it rolls off into the sunset. I've got some personal Amiga news. Sure. I'll, I'll spout Lay out on real me, quick. Man. Um, remember when you went to Ireland? I do. I was sitting back at the pad lamenting the fact that I was not in Ireland. And so I made two crazy Amiga purchases that day as I watched your videos. And one of them was this um, Amiga 600 slash 1200 Go Ek drive uh, to uh, stick it in my 1200 since I took the uh, since I took the GoTek out and get put it in your 600. Uh, Unlike uh, the Gotex of that I've seen before, this one was actually custom designed to fit in that disk drive slot. Uh, it, I also got the screen with it too, uh, and I just got around. I got it in the mail this week and installed it. It's a pretty good setup. I haven't got to fool with it that much, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting slant on the Gotex. For one thing, it it doesn't require USB. It's got SD card support. It's got instead of having the two little buttons you would normally have on an, on these things, it's got a half sort of a half circle. If you, you can tilt one way to go down, tilt the other way to go up, and you can just hit enter on the circle to select. And that way you're not feeling around trying to fill those buttons mm -hmm. back there. And also this mm -hmm. sticks out further. Mm -hmm. So it's actually something you can use without a, a lot of hassle. 
uh, on the thing. It Tell also, me about the screen. I haven't gotten, I actually, I've got the screen hooked up, but I haven't actually, I just now manufactured a card to put in it. So this is all preliminary, but I did install it and turn it on. Is the screen a, <laughs> an LED segment screen or is it a full on LCD? It's, I don't, I haven't, I haven't tried it yet, so I don't know exactly okay. what it is. Okay. Uh, I, I got, but here's the kicker. Also, this thing comes with the built in speaker, which I didn't have before. The whole thing cost me 50 bucks, mm -hmm. which is a real good deal. Mm -hmm. And it also comes with the way it fits in your 1200 and a 600 too, presumably, is it they, I guess these 3D printed this like a bracket thing and it actually fit right in, screwed right in, solid as a rock. With, this is a much easier uh, task than trying to cajole a, a, a GoTech in. Go yeah, yeah, you know, if you want to install it internally, which I've done that before, but I mean, you're talking, you know my methods. And then when I didn't cut, I was using double-sided tape. Yeah. This is like, it's in, it's solid, it's no headache. Now, the flip side of this, as we've learned, this thing came from like, uh, gosh, it came from the Czech Republic, uh, the fellow that makes it. And of course, it came with zero documentation, mm -hmm. nothing. So you're on your own. Right. I, I went to the website to get a little bit of action, but it, it's we, we've seen this trend that they no one's. I guess they just figure if you're ordering this, you're smart enough to stick it in. Mm -hmm. They don't know me. I, get, I need all the documentation <laughs> I can give. But anyway, but hopefully next time we we record, I will have an update on this thing. But it's I will say so far it looks nice and it yeah, came in good, in good shape. Definitely, definitely keep us updated yeah. on that. Maybe we'll bring it by computer club sometime. <laughs> we'll do, sir. All right, Aaron. Let's jump right in to Buggy Boy. Buggy Boy. Now. Um, we had actually, I know we've done, was it you that did Amigos play on this at one point? I know I've seen, you I, know, I had played this before. It's so funny because I could have sworn, I would have bet you dollars to no nuts <laughs> that yeah. when Rob was here, when he came to visit us from Oklahoma, yeah. that we sat down and did an Amigos yes. on Buggy Boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you couldn't find but it. But I guess maybe we did, recorded Sprite Castle. Yeah. Or... I don't know. I just associate Buggy Boy with with Rob Flack and Aaron. I don't know why. Yeah, that's weird. So, uh, Buggy Boy released in '88. Uh, <clears throat> it was one disc, published by Elite. Uh, we've ran into a few of their games over the years. Uh, they they uh, they published some real duds, but it's some good stuff too. They did Thundercats, but they did Paper Boy. So you're know, half and half, uh, and uh, developed. Unknown. So I'm assuming Elite also developed it because they've got. I know uh, um, Lemon had developer unknown and or had developer as Tetsumi, which they did the arcade game. So I'm guessing they probably didn't do the Amiga port. Yeah, maybe Elite uh, just and, did it in house. And I think uh, 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 the other site had it listed as just unknown. Oh, so, like yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we do know who did it. Uh, it was coded by Martin Ward. Uh, and also he did the graphics. Uh, Martin Ward did uh, Aqua Blast, uh, Commando, Live and Let Die, Paperboy, and World Championship Soccer. The other coder and graphic guy was Richard Frankish. Uh, he did Ghosts and Goblins, Akari Warriors, also Paperboy. He did Pool. He did Revenge of the Mutant Camels. Uh, and he did sp the Space Harrier series on here. So these guys have done a few things. This ran on the OCS. Um, now, this game, uh, it's funny, because uh, I had played this in the arcade, and you, I'm, I'm assuming you knew about the arcade version. I did know about it, but yeah. I've never played the arcade I version. I have played the arcade version. The arcade, this was also known as Buggy Boy in some places, but in the States, it was not known as Buggy Boy. Which is, uh, that the, in the States, it was known as Speed Racer. This is one of the few times where we got the cooler <laughs> name, yeah. not the lamer Buggy name. Boy is a lamer name, yeah. that's for sure. So this came out uh, in the arcades in 85. Now, uh, um, I don't know if I ever actually saw this in an arcade. I tried to rack my head and I can't remember ever seeing it. But I mean, I could have seen it on maybe Starcade or something, but mm -hmm. it's not something that, it's, I'm assuming it wasn't something that really uh, came out a lot of places. Again, developed by Tetsumi and was published in North America by Data East. Uh, so uh, it, it, got, uh, it got, I guess it got some action because Data East was doing pretty good stuff b back in those days. Uh, now, this game had some, and one of the things that interested me about this, and I've certainly never seen this, this is one of those games that had a, a set down cockpit version that had three screens. Yes, both. that is the, when I, when I was doing some comparisons, yeah. that was the thing that I noticed right away, and I was like, wow, yeah. this is different. And the funny thing about it is, the, the, this game did not need a three-screen setup. I can tell you that right now. Yeah, it the plays, majority of the three-screen, the two side screens are mostly window dressing. Yeah. 
Uh, the, the other game that that ran on that same hardware was a game called TX1, uh -huh. which I never have played, but I, I'd heard of it. I'd not played it. Uh, Tetsumi, uh, when this came out, uh, there were a few other games they did. Like we mentioned TX1. I've, most of these guys I've never heard of. Gray Out, Apache 3, Cycle Warriors, a Super Delta Force. None of these games, I don't think I've ever heard of any of them. So I'm, I don't know what... I'm assuming Buggy Boy is their big game, mm -hmm. but you know, for what that's worth. So, <clears throat> the Amiga version comes around. Now, again, I said this came out in 88, so three years passed, and they, they let this sucker go. Now, um, what is this game, uh, Boat? Well, you are the Buggy Boy, presumably, or the Speed Racer, and you're in a Doom Buggy, and, you're, and you, you have your choice of tracks, uh, and I will say right out of the gate, it lets you pick the track you want. There are five courses. There's off-road, then there's north, Monte Carlo, south, southern cross, east, safari, and west, Paris, Dakar. All right, now, I will say these tracks are different, aren't they, mm -hmm. both? I mean, there's they're, they're off-road is off-road. Some There are some that are like in a, sort of like a jungly area, and yeah. there's some that are like, like on the side of a hill. These aren't just like different named variations on the same track. Right, absolutely. It's not like pole position. Right. Uh, you know, I should mention before we move on, this this was not the only conversion of this. Uh, you've got an Amstrad version. You've got the Atari ST version, a C64 version of Some Renown, a Spectrum version, which I, I have to say that looked interesting as well. Um, so what were your initial thoughts on this thing, Boat, when you fired it up? Uh, I, I love this game. I mean, uh, I I thought that it it ran smoothly. Yeah. It didn't run too fast. It didn't run too slow. Um, I thought it was very very colorful. Uh, it, it seems like so many times when we're playing Amiga games, I come away thinking, boy, you know, the Amiga color palette was so bright. It had the opportunity. You know, it could be so bright, but they so many choices were made to make games look drab. This is not one of these games. This game pops uh, with that uh, <laughs> sort of Sega-ish blue sky palette. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I noticed right away, like you mentioned, is that you have your choice of track right from the beginning. Yes. Of course, the first thing that I think about whenever I play any Amiga game is how does this thing stack up to Lotus? Right. You know, and it's a different game than Lotus. It is it's a very different, different. It's a different yeah. kind of game. Um, but I think that I would rather play this game most of the time rather than Lotus, and I'll tell you why. I would rather play a time trial solo race uh, than race against AI, particularly in older games mm -hmm. when computer AI is just random nonsense. You know, it's not like the, the AI programming in enemy cars at this time was very good. Mm -hmm. um, so I would rather be tracked on how well, and another thing that I love about this game, anytime that you have multiple ways to play, multiple ways to succeed, it's a winner in my book. So you can go straight for time, get time bonuses, and, 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 and proceed, or you can do the flag minigame, or you can do the gate thing. You know, there are tons of different ways to get points in this game, and that's great. Um, I like the way that you can totally ignore anything other than making it to the next checkpoint and making it around the track. So the game doesn't punish you other than lowering your score if you don't go under all the gates or if you don't get all the flags in the right order or anything like that. So I was very impressed by that. I thought that the whole um, multiple drivable terrain thing was cool. You know, you can hop on logs in a very Lotus style where it causes your, your vehicle to bounce up in the air. But what's cool is that if you don't hit it at the right angle, you go up onto two wheels. Again, this doesn't make you crash right away. It does make your vehicle more susceptible to crashing. Uh, there are also areas of each course where you can drive up on the side of the track and almost like a stun runner type thing, which I thought was really neat. Um, there's a great amount of variety in each track. Uh, they put a lot of care, of course this is an arcade port, so when I say they, I really mean the arcade developers. They put a lot of care into making each one feel different, and I appreciate that. That sort of makes up for the fact that you don't have multiple buggies to select. Um, the, the thing that I do not like about this game is the sections where you have to drive on the bridges over the water. 
Yeah, I, I was found wondering that, if we're going to go yeah, there. I yeah, I found that to be incredibly frustrating. I always fell into the water yes. because, and I think it's just the way that your 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 buggy is drawn on screen. You know, the, in the grand tradition of these older racing games, the the screen moves around your buggy. Your buggy doesn't really move on the screen, and whenever you have a narrow thing to negotiate with lots of twists and turns in it, it's just really hard to do that. What did you think of the control scheme in this? Oh, I thought it was fine. Um, you know, this is uh, definitely, well, I didn't think it was fine because I cheated. Um, I mapped the up button. I knew you were going to yeah, say that. I because mapped I, the up button yeah. to, another, to another button. Up to accelerate games are no good. That's no good. I knew you were going to say that because you liked the game a lot more than I did. And one of the main problems I had with it was I didn't like holding up to, yeah. to go. I can see how that would be a killer. Let me, let me tell you. Now, <clears throat> first of all, this game... Uh, not being made by Atari is a surprise. This reminds me of an Atari yeah, game. Absolutely. It's a little bit like uh, um, Tubin. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like uh, Stun Runner, or I mean, not Stun Runner, but uh, Road Blasters. It's got, it's the got, same, got that, yeah, that Paperboy era, like the, the way that the drawing is yeah, done. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, so this reminded me of an Atari game. Um, I didn't like the control of this game, and that was my biggest. And first of all, you were dead on about the water. Going across these bridges was really tough. And you know me, I've got multiple joysticks at my disposal. Mm -hmm. And just to make make sure, I tried it on the PC and I tried it on, on, on the Amiga. And I just did not, it didn't control well. I don't like the animation for your buggy. I'll tell you that right now. It just, you don't ever feel like you're going very fast uh, in the buggy. It's, it just, I mean, it, it's goofy. I don't like the way it, the back end of it wobbles. If it's, you don't like goofy, you're not going to like this. Well, I mean, I mean, there are, there are parts that I like. I agree with some of the stuff you said. It, it's neat to have multiple paths forward. Uh, I mean, they're goofy paths, but they're definitely multiple ways to score. And you, or, and you could, like I said, you can just kind of go for points. I wasn't very successful at this game. I'll be honest with you. It, it took me a good while to be able to even finish a course. I would almost always run out of time. So I thought that I thought the time thing was tough. And that you've got gates that add time, but they give you very little time. Yeah, yeah. I will say that the difficulty is steep. Yeah. Um, I think I very rarely finished courses, but I had fun even though I wasn't because I could compete for score. Yeah. You know? I mean, there were aspects of this game. It's not like I'm here to... First of all, I don't think this was better than Lotus. I can tell you that right now. I don't think it was better than any of the Lotuses. But... Uh, because, but I mean, really, this is, it is a racing game, but it's, it's, like I said, you don't really feel like you're going that fast. I don't, it's, it's almost like a, I don't know what it is. I mean, it is a well, racing it's, game, but it's, it's real. it is an off-roady type game. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's hard to compare it to like one of those. I, I like the multiple, uh, I like the multiple play areas. Like you said, I like the fact that you can choose any area you want to go to. Those are all, that's sort of forward thinking mm -hmm. in a racing title. I don't even mind the gear shift uh, situation, your pole position, any type thing. But again, the, the controls let me down yeah. just because having to push forward that whole time, I, my hand got tired. And I, just didn't, I never liked that. I never liked having to do that. Yeah. So I can understand how mapping a button to that, I thought about doing that. That I made the game in, impossibly better. Did you, I, did you try it without mapping oh yeah, the button? And I would have hated it. I yeah. mean, I, I did it for a while and I was like, screw this. <laughs> you know? And so. Uh, it's got like, I, when you when you go to the, end game or put your initials and stuff there's some there's some good music that plays right there uh there's uh like I said, it's it runs at a decent clip it's not all that together different than the arcade i mean i i've played this in the arcade and i didn't really like it there either so i'm not going to fault the guys for doing a bad job like they actually did a pretty good job uh, with it i mean like i said i, I would have went um I think I would have went button for accelerate and maybe up for for gear shift or down. You oh could yeah, kind of I mean that. You, you do button for accelerate and then you do up and down for gear shift. Right, I and mean, we played games that do it that way. I think I'd rather do that because than the what button. is the, what is the button used for in this game? Anything? No, no, the button is, is gear the gear shift. shift. Okay, I yeah, can remember. Yeah, okay, and that's yeah. so. Yeah, I'm yeah, saying you could. Have, I'd like to have. Had it's it. insane that they didn't do it the other way. Well, I mean, I can understand. It. I mean, for ease of use, they did it probably the easiest way. But I mean, it's just for me personally. I didn't like that ass, and so because I needed all the control help I could get, the the course is littered with obstacles, mm -hmm. and it can get frustrating when you just keep hitting stuff over and over rocks. Now and stuff. it it is it is frustrating. You're right, but this game you crash in the outrun style, not in the pole position style. So you just sort of bounce out of well, the way, and it takes you a second to get. But you or, no, you can explode if you hit the walls. Or you uh, when you go through the tunnels, you explode, that's or if true, you go yeah. in the water. But for your garden variety. Uh, obstacle the rocks and things like that. You won't explode. You'll just yeah. But I mean, it's still, it's it's it was. I found it frustrating and it lowered my. 
you know, this is one of those games that I'm not going to fault anyone for liking because I, I know they're, I know it's pretty popular. Uh, it's just not a game that I enjoyed that much. Like I said, there were I, I understood what they were doing. I liked, I liked all the choices, uh, and I thought it was flashy. And I thought, like I said, I think they did a good job porting it, and I really do. Now, there's a lot of people that insist that C64 version this is better. I didn't play it. Uh, it didn't look better, but I've heard it plays better. Well, so. I, I, I've played I've played this on the C64. Oh, have you? This is one of the games. Again, the, when when Flock came over, some we did something with this. Yeah. I just can't remember what it was. But um, but it, it was uh, it's a different game. It's a totally different game. It's like the specy ports where they change things, yeah. you know. So it's a different game, but it's good. I mean, it's incredibly smooth. It definitely runs at a smoother frame rate than the Amiga version does. I think um, I think overall though, I, I'll give them good marks for the you know getting for the conversion. I do like the ability to get the flags in order, but the problem with that is if you get obsessed with it, you're screwed. Like well, I can never, so you have again, to. Again, it's, it's a push your luck thing. It, well, it is. I, I wish, I wish the time gates gave you more time, or they just gave you more time. Because yeah. I think there's a game here. I like the idea of a, a game where you can push points because mm -hmm. you know we like that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I never felt like I had enough time to, to mess with it. I and, agree. And it's not like I'd always played this a couple of times. I mean, I played it. I played it from when we heard about it. I've played it a lot. I'd played it before then, and I'd always had the same problem. I just, and I don't feel like I'm very good at it. And I didn't feel like I was getting a whole lot better. I mean, I like I said, it, some on some tracks I could get to the end, but often I didn't even come close to the end. Then it was frustrating, and I never could settle on a good strategy to to succeed at the game. Yeah. Uh, so there were just a lot of stuff. There were just a lot of little nagging things that didn't do it for me. Uh, but I mean, I don't think it's a bad game. I just think it's I'm, and doesn't fit my personal taste for a driving game. Yeah, I think that this is definitely one of the better ones. I prefer this to say Jaguar XJ220. I think uh, you're right. It's not a Lotus game. Well, Jaguar not, is more conventional than yeah. this. You know, I, I like. I like racing games where there's other stuff to do besides just blindly go around the track. Uh -huh. um, and so this game is right up my alley. It's why I like Stun Runner, you know. Um, but uh, but yeah, in this game, like you said, if they would have given you a little bit more time, or if they would have made the time gates actually just give you like 20 seconds more or something like that, yeah, it would have made this game have a lot more staying power. I think that as far as arcade conversions go, this is definitely one of the better ones. Yeah, and, and I will say it's something we should mention is that. Really, almost all the tracks are just long. Like you don't lap, so you go all the way. You know, I think there's only one track that you do lap. So I think the rest of them, there, you go from the beginning it's to the end. One, yeah, one That's way good through. because mm -hmm. there's a lot more to see, and it's like, you know, they, they mix it up nice. I mean, it, this isn't like uh, it's not like a super awesome graphical experience on every level, but I mean, they do a good job of making it different. Yeah, I will say also that popping the two wheels, I, that is cool. It is cool. In fact, I, I think I control just as well on two wheels as I did on four. Uh, but like I said, I just never it never got that that feeling of really going fast. And for me, I kind of like to go fast. But I mean, it, it's just like I said, it's a personal preference. I think more than anything else. Um, <clears throat> this game uh, reviewed very well uh, for the most part. Boat. Um, I'll go over some of these. Uh, Advanced Computer Entertainment gave this uh, an eighty three percent. Uh, Amiga Computing gave it an 81. Uh, AUI gave it 8 out of 10. CU Amiga, 8 out of 10. Uh, and uh, the Games Machine, 77%. So it did, it did pretty well. I, would, and I, I think those are fair. I think those are fair reviews. I would probably, I'm not, like I said, it's not my bag, but it's not a bad game. I would probably put it somewhere in the C plus to B minus range for my personal taste, but I mean, for if this is your kind of game, I could see easily what people would give yeah, it an A. This is an A game for me. Let's see what Discord said. Uh, Graham W. Vebke says, I played this game so much on the Atari ST, and I'm pleased the Amiga version was also coded by Martin Ward. Yep. This is how a lim time limited checkpoint racing game should be, and I scored a 9 out of 10. The publisher's elite. Did a great job making sure the C64 and CPC ports and the slower ZX Spectrum port, which was not coded by Martin, also hit, in my opinion, the same game standard. Colorful art with big sprites, race on five different tracks with obstacles competing against the clock. You collect points with bonus flags for bonus points in time with the challenge to collect them in order. Drive over logs to launch into the air but risk bouncing off the track or even falling into the water. The sound is the weakest part of the game, but it does the job. Yeah. The gameplay is so solid, I'm going to call it one of the best Amiga arcade conversions. However, it may be rose-colored glasses, but I feel the Atari ST version is still better. Mm. 
uh, Pixels at Dawn writes, I can't really comment on the accuracy of the port as most of my experience of Buggy Boy comes from the Spectrum version which plays very differently. However, Buggy Boy is a pretty solid game and quite different from most racers with all the obstacles on the track and with all the flags and the gates. It becomes more like slalom skiing than racing. Yes. That's true. Yes. That said, the game has never blown me away and I prefer the Amiga's more standard racers to this. Good but not great, 7 out of 10. Yeah, I'm gonna, I think Pixels nailed it for me. That's pretty much the way I looked at it. Um, I should mention that Lemon gave this a 7.32, so they're sort of falling in line here in that C area. I did look this up on eBay. I didn't see any of the American version. I did see Buggy Boy in several. Buggy Boy got released in several different pack, like in, like compilations, uh, like three or four. And so I saw various compilations. I had it, but if you want the actual uh, game boxed, you're going to be looking in the twenty to thirty buck range up in that area. Mm. So man, eh, you might you might be worth it if that's, if that's your cup of tea. Overall, though, it's definitely a refreshing uh, driving game. It just that's not necessarily my cup of tea. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's talk about what's been going on on the YouTube channel this week. All right, weekend. man. Let's see what we got. I think you put up a lot of good stuff this week, and not only or, me, and, and and among others, I wasn't even sure who put up the other stuff. So let's talk about this stuff. Um, so we're gonna start things off with uh, we have a new edition of the ranking of Amiga platforms. Oh, this was something. I did have a look at this. Yeah, so... Uh, this a burial. Is, I finally got a chance to get around to taking a look at the great Guiana sisters. Uh, <laughs> and it's not very good. Uh, did you no, didn't like it when we reviewed it a long time ago. No big surprise that the game that was a blatant ripoff of Mario uh, is a blatant ripoff of Mario. Um, it, this game has very little to recommend it other than if you somehow do not have access to any consoles and you're just a computer person, and then I guess it's okay. Um, we also have the newest edition of ARG Presents. You want to talk a little bit about the Micro B, Aaron? Oh my gosh. The Micro B was quite a chore, if you want the truth. Uh, there is not a ton of information on this thing. And uh, like and or videos, we I had a real tough time researching this thing, but we did manage to play some. We played five games on it, boat, and uh, uh, they were basic. Let's just put it that way. I mean, they weren't bad. The micro B story is actually pretty interesting, and in the and the its rise and fall, uh, and it's sort of. I mean, you it's one of those systems where you can blame Apple among others for just coming in there and kicking them out of schools, mm -hmm. uh, and then they. Um, amazingly, believe it or not, the last round of the micro B, they, they tried to make a computer that had 68,000 and a Z80, two Z80s, I believe. And just as they were putting this thing together, it's ran out of money. And so they were done. They got bought and then they just never came back. I so. noticed that you didn't have any gameplay footage of we the We did not B, because so I couldn't they're... capture it properly. So I, we didn't get any gameplay footage on this thing. Uh, part of this, I'll tell you something. Uh, this, was, this was one of the toughest episodes we had to put together. I mean, I really struggled to try to have enough to, to put it together. And that's why mm -hmm. we covered so many games on it. So yeah, yeah it, was a, it was a difficult one. But we, it was still fun. We've gotten pretty good uh, response from it. Australian, oh, you know, that reminds me of something real quick. I was flipping through a, uh, a magazine today, Radio Electronics Magazine from 85, Tree picked up at the, do at the uh, $5, or at the uh, dollar store, or, or the Goodwill. And lo and behold, I mentioned this because the, the microbees on Australian computer, here is an ad uh, for the old uh, uh, Dick Smith that was out of America. I, I didn't believe knew that, that when you put that up there. Yeah, I put it, I tweeted it that there was a double paged ad for Dick Smith. They were selling stuff out of San Jose, California. So I didn't know it, but Dick Smith uh, Electronics had a presence in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that because they're out of Australia and they were responsible for the other Australian computers we've looked at. So I thought that was kind of neat. The Super 80. And the, and the Wizard. Yeah. You know? So yeah. yeah. Um, Pixels at Dawn has uh, done a tremendous amount of work. He's been on fire. Uh, editing footage from the <laughs> SWAG convention, uh, which look, is Look the, who that is. Yeah, this is the Don <laughs> himself. Uh, he went over to the Southwest Amiga group and uh, and availed himself of all of the greatness that, that, that can be found over there. And he's put up several talks. There was the guy that did the uh, I've got to watch this, because this guy is animated. Oh, yeah, yeah. He needs his own show, this yes. guy. Um, so... Um, 
anyway, Pixels does a ton of editing work. He's sort of the opposite of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you owe it to yourself if you're an Amiga fan at all to check out. There's an interview with Stephen Jones, uh, Matthew I did Lehman, watch some of that the one, yeah. uh, Amiga Kit guy, uh, Graham Cowie of the Rygar AGA fame. So make sure you check out the, uh, the whole weekend is encapsulated forever. Yeah, in, in, he in did a great videos. job. Well done. Yeah. Well done. I kept seeing his pop up. I'm like, these are awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I did find time to do play a little bit of the ZX Spectrum on original hardware, and it had, Very been, good. It had been a long, long time since I haven't I'd seen done this a either. Stream. And uh, I just had time for two quick games. I did a little bit of 3D bat attack. I'm oh, telling you, man, not bad. Of all the three dimensional bat attack games based on the uh, the ZX Spectrum, this is the best one. It's, it's, How many it's, are it's, there? Uh, there's hundreds, hundreds of hundreds. bad attack. Uh, this is this is a game that's very similar to the game that we played on um, the Coco. Remember the Demon game where they the, chased you right, around? Right, yeah, yeah. So uh, make sure you check that out. And then I also played a really unique game called Devil's Crown, and this is your typical wacky. Holy Nuts smokes. Oh, yeah, Spectrum game with tons of bright colors, and you're collecting items, doing inventory management. Is it mega like hard? That. It's mega hard. Yeah, it look, yeah. that looks insane. It's right hard there. as nails, but it was a fun It was a fun time. So I'll be slowly going through our ginormous list or, you know, stack of cassettes. You know, look and, at the color right there. There's, there's really no clash going on. That's no. quite impressive, isn't it? I mean, that, that's a very, that's about the most color I think I've seen on a Spectrum very screen. Well coded. Very impressive. Very well yeah. coded, yeah. So, um, and speaking of Spectrum, last week's uh, Our Sinclair was about Cliffhanger. I love this game. Yeah, <laughs> this, was, this was a real surprise. Uh, this was Phantom Slayer. That's right. That's what it was called. Um, this was a, it's a sort of a Wile E. Coyote Roadrunner simulator yes. just without the license. So uh, make sure you check that out if that is of interest to you. If, if you've ever seen the villain, you would love this game. It's the exact same thing. Now, um, I believe, oh yeah. And finally, uh, Doodlebug, Aaron. Yeah, I have not even entered this contest because I'm horrible at this game. Yeah, so, uh, you know, last week's Coco game was uh, Doodlebug, and the folks over at Coco Talk are doing a high score challenge based on Doodlebug, <laughs> and uh, I recorded, this was my first attempt, Yeah. and uh, and I did pretty well. I got like six 600,000, so. Uh, are you hanging with the no. big dogs? Not six hundred thousand. Let's try sixty four thousand. Right. Off by a factor of ten. Well, close enough. Um, but anyway, uh, I you know I started out real strong, but I think that the the, the crew over at the Coco Talk they are real pros when it comes to the, gaming. And those guys will devote the time. They to will it, devote sure. the time for sure. So, uh, but anyway, I had a good time. I love Ladybug and I love Doodlebug by extension. So uh, you did a good job on the show too because uh, I was. Your knowledge of of the way the game plays and the rules that were I mean I, I you did a great job on that I was <laughs> because that thing is not the easiest to understand I've never quite had a, I've never had a real good grasp of of the all all that stuff so well I was glad to to be informative and yeah finally it happened finally <laughs> um, we have a new uh, amigos interview that was just released where I talked to our friend uh, and uh, podcasting colleague Ravi Abbott but we're not talking about Amiga. We're talking about his early days in the garage rave scene. I love it. Now I know you've got some stories to tell from when you were involved in the garage rave scene. Nothing I can say until I'm until I'm retired. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but it's, it was real fun talking to Ravi about uh, you know bringing big crates of records around and 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 his early days with Dan. You know Dan was a legit power power player in the DJ scene no back kidding. in the early 90s. So yeah, uh, if you're interested at all in uh, the UK rave scene and just hear it from Ravi, make sure you check that out. Yeah, and if you, if you speaking of Ravi, right before we went on, he wrapped up his DJ set for today. So if you're in, if you want to check out Ravi's channel, go over and mix. Go over and, and today's, it was, what was it called? Dark, it was dark rhythm or something oh, like that. Oh, that man. sounds right up your alley. Yeah, it was. He put he, he <laughs> stuck in some uh, he stuck in some good stuff in there. You and put that on while you're listening to CBS Mystery Theater. I had I had it on at work, and my buddy was like, "What is that?" I'm like, "This is my buddy Ravi, man. He's laying down some thick fat beats yeah, on his man. Amigas, and you know Ravi's got both the Amigas, and he's got this homemade gimmick with knobs and crap on it. And there's he's going crazy. He's got a Bitmap Brothers shirt. He's got the mm. headphones on. I'm like, he's got it, man. Oh, this yeah. is perfect. I loved it. Yeah, he's 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 yeah. got he's got the gimmick and the skills. He's living the dream. I I wish I could do that kind of crap. You should do that stuff in, in your with your band. I should definitely do it. You I know? should just okay everybody grab a knob and start twisting. I wouldn't put it that way. <laughs> that could put you in the courts right there. 
<laughs> all right, Aaron, as we wrap up, I want to thank all the fine folks that are with us in chat. Did you know, fine listener, that we record the show live every Friday at around 5.30 Eastern time, and you can join the party over on twitch.tv slash Amigos Retro Gaming. We got tons of people in the house. Edvin, Helen, 10-Minute Amiga Retrocast, Della Mort 78, Treyguard 82, Pixels at Dawn Gaming doing a fine job modding. Uh, Polyester Lynx is here. Picard 2010. Make it um, so. L. Curtis B. Ricky DeRocher. Skior Bjorn L. is here. Uh, Bark Bit in the house. Retro Jerry's Retro up in there Jerry. somewhere. So uh, we thank you for joining us live. It's always a lot more fun doing the show with the crowd. And uh, oh, thank you, Pix. He just reminded me that this week's game was chosen by Cameron Armstrong. All right, Amigos man. Game Selection Committee member Cameron Armstrong. It was a good choice. Yeah, yeah. So we thank him and all of the AGSC members that voted on his title. We also want to thank all the fine folks, including Retro Jerry, that have subscribed to us on Twitch. <laughs> uh, Retro Jerry, Rushi MSX, Peeplo, Frodo NL, Anguish Autour, La Sooner, Bike Me. That's my new catchphrase. Is it Bike, bike You? Me. Mm. Uh, the Slow Norris, Chris Folds, Buck Owens. The, the legendary <laughs> Buck Owens. That's right. Paco Take, Takte, Wing Chun <laughs> Wolf. Brother Bill, still adolescing, Silver Streak 72, and Go To Go Sub. You know, I noticed, uh, look who's in the house. It's Joe the Zombie. Oh, so I didn't real see Joe the Zombie, real time Twitch Prime subscription. Thank you. And just a reminder, guys, that if you have subscribed to us through Twitch Prime in the past, uh, you do need to renew that manually every month. And if you'd like to do that, we'd really appreciate it. I'd like to see them make that automatically renew. I would like it's to see that. It's a real that pain. Too. Yeah. 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 Um, so. Before we close out, of course, we can't end the show without the Patreons. Yeah, we can. We can end it. We can end it without that. We can never end it without it. You know, Eep. I, I played last week's episode for Eep. Oh yeah. To, uh, to, to show her What'd the she song, do? <laughs> and she was just like, she just couldn't stop laughing at you. At me? Like, yeah, what did I, I never, do? I, ne I never noticed because I'm too busy reading the names that you go through a, a variety of emotional responses through your face. Yeah, it's it's an and... it's an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> well, I mean, if you can hear what's coming out of you, it's it's hard to it's hard not to react. Let's just put it that way. So, um, yeah. last last week's um, winner was Pac Billy. There was no winner last week. Are you surprised? There were all those survivors. Pac Billy's the man. He's the man. We need to get this guy on the uh, Name That Tune. Yeah. Uh, last week's song was uh, Carol, uh, Carol King's 1971 hit, So Far Away. You had trouble with it, getting your name out there. You then. really like to make fun of people when they mispronounce things. No, you said it, right? You but to Brent it, all no, the time. It seemed like you were saying it like in reverence. That's why I was saying it. It's like, right. wow. I mean, I like her. She's a good singer. She is a good singer. That's her, not my favorite song. One of the one of the biggest selling albums of the 70s, which you'd never guess because the, the cover is her sitting on the uh, bench by the window with the cat. It's not a very, like, boy, this is going to sell a million copies. Yeah. Cover. Um, they were more laid back in those days, just pictures of them hanging out. That's true. Yeah. That was a thing in the 70s. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, we also got some new supporters. Also, congratulations, Pac Billy. <laughs> we got some new supporters this week. Mr. Cola has joined us. I, I know him well from, uh, I've seen him on other streams. Yeah. Good man. Good man. And Jurgen. Jurgen. You got to have Jurgen. You got to have Jurgen. Um, so, if you know this week's Patreon song, uh, you can send me an email at john at amigospodcast.com and uh, I will read your name as a winner on next week's episode. Or Survivor. <clears throat> oh, here we go. I gotta, I gotta take a sip of water. One thing that I don't like about this new water bottle, listen. Yeah. You hear that? Yeah. That's no good. That's not, no good not, for None of what you show. just did is good. That's not good for a video show to see you suck it on that thing. <laughs> Okay. Stick to the fancy water, pal. Hold on a second. Let me get in the mind space. What's going on here? That's how you stretch your vocal cords. Is that what a self vocal death pinch? You're a little low. No, it's, it's where they are. See? It's like... It's right yes, ahead, when You are going to hear a sucky, sucky sound here in just a few seconds. Here we go. Jurgen, Mr. Cola, Daniel Williams, Bernard Lucas, Jerry Dennington, Sorglob. Commodore Kid Bjorgvin, Goodman Son Terry Howard, Reflection Simon Ledge, Captain Crispy T. 
gigabytes. And caffeine, Mike W. Deckard, Threepwood, Gary Heather, Free Lunch, Kate Fox, David Pickford, Cameron Armstrong. Andy Jones, Lot of Sterminator, 10 Minute Amiga, Retrocast, Bernard Quinn, Retro Man Cave, Tim Drew and Simon Rose, Joseph Harrison, Kyle Letter, Rob O'Hara, Howard Nibs, Matthew Larimore, Andy Craig, Shonzo Colin, 419 Bark Bid, Roland Burke, Andrew Monks, Joe the Zombie, John Cook, Leaf Kellogg, Alan Cup, Bob Checo, Day Level Lord, John Marshall, Matthew Perron, Ricky DeRosha, Creepy Dead, Boy, Think You See Disease, The Slow, Norris Stephan, Sorkin, Mortensen, Edvin Helen, Blindo 75, Christopher Hassel, Ravi Abbott, Chris Folds, Dreamcatcher, Lauren Giroux, Graham, Bebke, Lane, Denson, Adam Batters, B. O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, Gary Huckersey, Brian Jones, Paul Harrington, Boss Man, Duncan Styles, Tapes from the Crib, Josh Nan, Adam Bradley, Jonas Rulo, THT, Eric Nelson, Kim, Tommy Humbridge, Dad, Daniel Banks, and Brutal Barrett, Goodle, Darren Coles, Jason Warns, Pixels of Dawn, and Kill Bjorn Barman. It sounded like some kind of weird German experimental music there at first, and then the experiment failed. <laughs> Man, I don't know what the, I don't know what in God's name that was. I try to encompass multiple people. Really? Yeah. You enc you encompass them in a big sheet of garbage. <laughs> my God! I wrapped them up in my. I love. couldn't tell what that was. If I'll tell you, Pack Billy, good luck, pal. You're the king. You figure that one out. You're. A, he's gonna go back and think about it. Figure these out. He's listening to them over and over. He's probably in a rubber room somewhere by now. <laughs> All right. Well. Uh, next week, Aaron, it is Puzzle Week. Here oh on the boy! <laughs> and uh, we are going to be we're going to be covering <laughs> Pushover. <laughs> this is the uh, other uh, Quavers based game <laughs> on the Amiga. You're not filling me with joy here, boat. <laughs> Quavers based puzzle game, eh? You know, one of my all time favorite memories of Amigos is is reading the uh, the Colin Curley instruction booklet. Yeah, uh, from uh, that the, shows uh, you how shallow game. that pool is, yeah. right there, boy. <laughs> so, oh um, man, make pushover. Sure you, make okay. sure you pack your Quavers for next week. I've been called a pushover more than a few times. So really? I think I'm qualified to do this game. Yeah. All right. Well, that sounds good. Well, guys, thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week. Until next week, again, redundancy alert. Adios. Adios.